some of their extreme environmental allies are constantly trying to shut down the resource development in Alaska that has been so vital for the health and well-being of the Alaska Native people. As the mayor of the North Slope Borough and another exceptional Inupiaq leader, Harry Brower, so eloquently wrote in the Wall Street Journal recently, quote, we treasure and protect our land and wildlife, the resources that executives and environmental groups in cities thousands of miles away from Alaska claim to care about. The way we see it, caring about the land and wildlife should also mean caring about the indigenous people who live in these communities. I'm sure Mr. Rexford would agree, and I very much look forward to his testimony. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you very much, Senator Sullivan. Now we get to hear from the witnesses themselves, and we'll turn first to Laura Polito. Through online Chair Merkley. Magic. Can y'all hear me okay? Uh, we can now hear you and we can see you. Thank you and welcome. Chair Merkley, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the committee. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on environmental justice. I'm delighted that the Environment and Public Works Subcommittee on Chemical Safety, Waste Management, and Environmental Justice and regulatory oversight is being reconfigured to include this urgent topic. I'm a professor at the University of Oregon and have been studying environmental justice for over 30 years. I first became interested in the environment growing up in Los Angeles and not being able to see the mountains due to the smog. I still remember the stench and burning in my lungs as a child. More recently, I moved to Oregon because Southern California was simply getting too hot and I suffered from heat sickness. Today, I would like to provide a brief introduction to environmental justice research and highlight what I think are some of the pressing issues faced today. Environmental justice refers to the fact that people of color and low-income populations in both urban and rural areas are disproportionately impacted by environmental hazards. But I really appreciate and agree with what uh, Senator Wicker said. It should be called environmental injustice. Environmental justice is also the name of the movement that has arisen to challenge these problems. Environmental justice traces its origins to the late 1980s. Several key events precipitated it, including protests in rural North Carolina against the dumping of PCB, farm worker struggles against pesticides, native reservations dealing with uranium waste, urban communities opposed to incinerators, and rural residents lacking access to clean water. In 1987, the United Church of Christ conducted the first national level study of uncontrolled hazardous waste sites and their proximity to various demographic to talk. Since then, environmental justice has had a major impact on the larger environmental movement and society. I would like to now briefly highlight some of the pressing environmental justice challenges that require action. First, cumulative impacts. Cumulative impacts refer to the need to take into account multiple forms of pollution and vulnerability that impact geographic communities. Almost all policy and permitting systems treat polluters individually while disregarding the cumulative impacts of industrial concentrations. This has produced a major mismatch in terms of public health and regulatory policy. For example, near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, there is an epidemic of childhood asthma, which is due both to the logistics industry as well as individual factories. In California, scholars have developed prototypes to begin considering cumulative impacts. And what these tools do is they enable individuals to identify the multiplicity of risks in a given place. Such tools need to be refined and applied across the country. Number two, climate change and heat. We know that low income and communities of color are the most vulnerable to climate change. They are vulnerable because they have fewer resources and capacity to respond to heat, cold, drought, and flooding. 
The end result is higher levels of death and displacement. This past summer in Eastern Oregon, the temperature hit a record 118 degrees. That in that particular heat wave episode, 118 people died in Oregon. In urban areas, there are significant differences in heat. Wealthier places tend to have more trees and shade, which led to a 25 degree differential in temperature in parts of Portland. In places like Mississippi, Louisiana, and South Carolina, it is the poorest who are most impacted by hurricanes and flooding as we saw in Hurricane Katrina, as well as South Carolina in 2015, as well as uh, uh, Senator Wicker's story as well. Exacerbating the situation is recent evidence that FEMA relief is far more likely to go to wealthier residents and homeowners versus low-income population and renters. Immediate resources need to be directed towards increasing shade, weatherization projects, sheltering the unhoused, and building a more reliant and sustainable energy system. And lastly, water access. As a wealthy country, we assume that access to clean potable water is not an issue, but that is untrue, especially in rural areas. Sometimes people get disconnected from the utility, such as in Flint and the contamination crisis, but rural communities are disproportionately impacted. For example, the Navajo reservation spanning both Arizona and New Mexico, has one of the highest proportions of households without plumbing. In parts of Appalachia, uh, there are communities that had water boil advisories for over five years. These problems require immediate attention and investments in infrastructure to solve the problems. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have all of our testimony before we go to questions. And next, Catherine Coleman Flowers. Thank you, Chair Merkley, uh, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the sub of the committee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Catherine Coleman Flowers, and I am a proud native of Lowndes County, Alabama, a rural area located between Selma and Montgomery. Lowndes County has a proud history of fighting for equality and the right to vote. In addition, most of the famous Selma to Montgomery Mars Trail goes through Lowndes County. It is where, uh, in the early 1900s, sharecroppers organized for jobs and justice. Many of his sons and later his daughters, including my father, three brothers, and myself served in the United States military. We have a deep legacy of holding up core democratic values. I stand on those values, learned as a country girl that grew up with a healthy respect for nature and I appreciate what our creator has provided for us, which includes the knowledge to know when we are out of balance with creation. In addition to that, that failure includes, uh, which is what we're seeing today exemplified through fish kills, more powerful storms, higher groundwater tables, sea level rise, heat domes, wildfires, droughts, floods, pollution, straight piping of raw sewage or failing wastewater treatment systems. I have often taken philanthropists and people from both sides of the aisle like Jeff Sessions, Bernie Sanders, Cory Booker, Doug Jones, and Bob Woodson to Lowndes County to see the infrastructure inequalities and to hear from local people what is needed to address them. At the height of the pandemic, Lowndes County had the highest death and infection rate per capita in the state of Alabama. Declining national life, uh, national life expectancies are a reminder of what happens when poverty, inequality, failing or no sanitation infrastructure and climate change comes together. The climate crisis impacts all of us. Throughout our nation, we are dealing with failing infrastructure and it also includes the most basic infrastructure, sanitation. In the town of Hainville, Alabama, the county seat of Lowndes, for more than 20 years, Ms. Charlie Mae Hawkins has been telling people about the sewage from a nearby lagoon that is backing up into her home. She is paying a wastewater treatment fee, yet all the town can provide is a pump truck to pump the sewage out of her yard from time to time. The failure is more pronounced whenever there is a hard rain. This is indicative of the failing infrastructure and sanitation inequality that exists throughout the United States. 
whether in Montgomery, Alabama, where many older black communities are on failing septic tanks, or Martin County, Kentucky, where poor white families are also seeking sanitation and environmental justice, as well as good paying jobs. During a recent visit to the town of Mount Vernon, New York, I've met families that have been unable to flush their toilets for more than 20 years. The American Jobs Plan provides an opportunity to deal with the climate crisis head on in forgotten communities. It is a chance to create jobs, to build infrastructure, to create sustainable economic development and make America a model of ingenuity where we can all have clean air and water in every community. With this funding, should come guardrails that will ensure that Mrs. Charlie May of Lowndes County or Linda McNeil from Mount Vernon, New York, will no longer get sewage in their yards or homes, lagoons are not built next to schools, and any sanitation system comes with the same performance and parts warranty we have come to expect from a car, a hot water heater, or a heating and cooling system. I am requesting that you all support investment in resilient infrastructure, including sanitation for all. And I request that we come together and confront this climate crisis and to ensure the future of our children, grandchildren, and seven generations to come. I thank you for this opportunity to speak before you today, and I look forward to continuing conversation about environmental justice and climate justice for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn to Tracy Harden. Welcome. Chairman Markley, Ranking Member Wicker, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Tracy Harden. I live in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, and I own and operate Chuck's Dairy Bar. In my testimony, I would like to provide the committee a real life example of how federal actions or inactions have disproportionately impacted minority and low income populations. The South Mississippi Delta is one of the poorest areas of the nation. 27% live in poverty and more than 62% of residents are minorities. Floods or the preparations for floods are a constant fixture in our lives. Growing up, I can remember packing every spring and being ready to leave home at any moment when the, if the water would rise. My mother was a school bus driver. When the water would rise, she would have to drive a route on the river levees, um, hours out of the way to get us to school. But the South Delta flooding of my childhood has been a regular occurrence even now as I see my nieces having to take these long bus rides to school. Unsafe levees, one of the earliest documented South Delta floods was in 1927, after which the federal government assumed a responsibility for managing the Mississippi River system and constructing structures, including 22 other pumping plants. Later, Congress expanded the, the government's responsibility, including in 1941, when it authorized the Yazoo Backwater Project. The Yazoo Backwater Project is comprised of three key features. Levees along the Yazoo River completed in 1978 that keep the water within the river during high water. The steel bayou gates, the steel bayou gates, the steel bayou gate. Hold on just a moment. Let's see if we can get a technical fix to that echo. Okay, go ahead. Okay, if I can go back just a little bit. The Yazoo Backwater Project is comprised of three key features. Levees along the Yazoo River completed in 1978 that keep the water within the river during high water. The steel bayou gates on the Yazoo completed in 1969 to prevent the Mississippi from flowing backwater into the South Delta. And the final unfinished feature, a set of pumps to pump water over the levee when the gates are closed. This system is interconnected, and without all three functioning features, it just doesn't work. My husband, Tim, and I purchased Chuck's Dairy Bar when our family farm sold in 2006. Chuck's has been in business since 1977, and it is a fixture in Truckee County, one of the few we have to serve our small community. 
It's a local hangout for everyone in Rowland Fork. We try to keep our prices low to make sure all of our neighbors, over a third of whom are living below poverty line, feel welcome. However, since we purchased Chucks in 2007, we have seen seven of the 12 worst backwater floods on record since the levees were completed in 1978. This year, water rose to almost 92 feet. We also had floods in 2008, 2009, 2016, 2018, 2020, and the worst of all, 2019, when the water devastatingly rose to over 98 feet. The 2019 flood inundated 548,000 acres, 231,000 acres of cropland, and 686 homes. Water was so high, we were fractions of an inch away from losing critical infrastructure, like our sewer systems. We call it the forgotten backwater floods because it received so little national attention despite shattering so many records. Annual flooding has an enormous lasting impact on our region, well beyond folks not being able to frequent my restaurant because they're not making a paycheck Populations are decreasing, economic opportunity is fleeting, lives and livelihoods are being lost. My friend Anderson Jones has been displaced from his home since 2019. Even though he had federal flood insurance and built three levees around his home, each one failed, which highlights the lack of understanding of environmental extremists who advocate alternatives to the pumps, if you can't get to your home because it's surrounded by water, you cannot maintain a levee. And even then, what way is that to live? In 2019, we saw the worst of it. Two residents even lost their lives in that flood. But unfortunately, the residents of the South Delta know we haven't seen the last of it. What we desperately need to stop the annual flooding in the Yazoo backwater basin is the final component of the project. We need the backwater pumps. This project is comprised of and has the support of environmental groups, including the Mississippi Wildlife Federation and the, Na and the Native Conservancy. In its environmental justice analysis, the Army Corps concluded that the backwater pumps would specifically benefit the community of color. We've been blessed with strong support from our representatives, Congressman Thompson, Senator Hyde Smith, and of course, Senator Wicker. Thank you. Today, I'm appealing to the rest of Congress and the Biden administration to help fulfill the promise that was made to the people of the South Delta 80 years ago to complete this essential project. Not doing so unfairly impacts people of color and the poor. It is the definition of an, envir an environmental injustice, and we need your help to finish the pumps. On behalf of my family, my neighbors, my friends in my community, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, Ms. Harden. Mr. Rexford. Good morning. For the record, Delbert Rexford. Chairman Merkley, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the subcommittee. I am honored to testify before you today. Senator Sullivan, thank you for affording me this opportunity. My name is Delbert J. Rexford. I am a member of the Inupiat Native Tribe of Barrow. I have lived in the North Slope since August 17, 1959, when we moved from Cotterbury to Barrow. That is a very very vivid memory in my mind. I am a shareholder and have been involved with the Opelvik Inupiat Corporation for over 40 years, fighting for the rights of our people and creating opportunities to provide economic, sustainable projects for future generations. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide a unique perspective, a first-hand perspective of the impact federal government activity has had on our environment, our community, our food, our water sources, workforce, and human lives. In 1971, Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, 
better known as ANGSA. Through ANGSA, the federal government agreed to convey to 12 Alaska Native Regional and over 200 village corporations 44 million acres of land in compensation of 962.5 million in settlement of Aboriginal land claims of Alaska's Native people in fee simple. I want to emphasize, Alaska Native people gave up 88% of their traditional and customary lands through this settlement. The Inubiat people of the Arctic Slope were the only people who did not support ANGSA. We were fighting for 99,000 square miles of traditional and customary lands, pristine land that sustains our life. We as a people are heavily dependent on subsistence resources, consisting of migratory birds, caribou, fish, marine mammals, that sustains our cultural and healthy way of life that supports our spiritual link to nature. It is our cultural belief and traditional Inupiat value that taking care of our environment and respecting it will continue to sustain our way of life for future generations. Under the terms of ANGSA, Alaska Native corporations are mandated, I repeat, mandated, to provide for the economy social and cultural well-being of their sh shareholders in perpetuity. This means throughout their lifespan. Today, Alaska Native Corporations serve over 100 shareholders who have been impacted by contaminants and pollutants that left behind by certain federal agencies throughout decades of, of occupancy. As detailed in my written testimony, in 1991, Congress also directed the Department of the Interior to, su to submit a report on contaminated lands conveyed through ANGSA. Importantly, the Department of Interior report asserted that ANCs would not be held liable for prior contamination and reinforced the circular law that requires the federal government to clean the abandoned, contaminated properties left behind by federal agencies of the United States. In 1998, Department of Interior agreed to take the leadership role to facilitate the cleanup of ANCSA contaminated lands. A 2016 update proposed that the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation and Environmental Protection Agency oversee cleanup of the sites. This 2016 update also stated that BLM does not I repeat, does not have the authority to provide liability relief under CERCLA for previous landowners that consisted of federal agencies occupancy during that period, contaminating the properties. Also detailed in my written testimony is this report, in detail on historical failure of numerous government agencies to accept the leadership role, to take the lead to clean up our lands contaminated by the United States government and their agencies. I am here today to share my firsthand knowledge as a lifelong Alaska resident, proudly born in the territory of Alaska, prior to statehood of the state of Alaska. I am proud of that. And I have seen that change over my lifetime. I have grown up on this land I have hunted, I have fished, I have whaled, and I have also worked the cleanup projects that the, the government has done over the years on those sites that the federal agency abandoned. This land the federal government contaminated and left behind for future generations, further risking human lives. That causes a little emotion in me. When I was a child, we swam in the lake Little did we know that there was contaminants disposed of in the lake that contained solid waste, transformers, petroleum products. We were just kids, but we didn't know. We just wanted to have fun in the water. We didn't know the government had contaminated this lake. In 1963, we had a 100-year storm, 
severely damaging the Department of Navy's uh, 2.5 million gallon fuel bulk farm that went all over the what is now the former Naval Arctic Research Facility. Furthermore, there was heavy equipment that was staged that was pushed into the Elson Lagoon. Hubert Hobson and Morgan Solomon were nearly killed when their boats hit those objects. And lucky today, uh, Mr. Hobson is still with us. And, and this is just a example of things that we live with. Another example of Department of Defense abandonment of Alaska's North Slope. On occasion, hunters will come across explosive devices left by the military, which are, which are likely decades old and pose a dangerous threat to, to human life. I'd like to my colleagues and, and, and friends in King Cove, Alaska, Cumbersome permitting problems have prevented a 12-mile access road from being built that would allow local residents to the only life-saving hospital within 30 miles. And yet people die because they can't get there. People die. Currently, King Gove, residents only access to health care either by air transport or telehealth. Thawing permafrost is revealing solid waste burial sites that were previously unknown. When I walked across the land with Bureau of Land Management and Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, we could smell the diesel, the fuel, and our feet went through the ground, and there was debris under the ground. And this is the kind of contaminants that we're dealing with that we can't even develop this land. We can't disturb it. According to the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, there are an estimate of approximately 2,400 unknown sites that we don't know of, but they've only documented what are known and reported and, and documented. As many of you are aware, the presence of PFAS on abandoned military property continues to expose our community to severe public health threats where our drinking water shortages are compromised by surface and subsurface contaminants. Case in point, Imekpak Lake, the drinking water source for the United States Air Force since 1959, and, and drinking water source for the Battle Whaling Captains Association and their whaling crews when there's no glacial ice available. That is a contaminated lake now, recently reported with PAPS. Sorry for my emotions. This land that they transferred to my people without complete cleanup and removal of contaminants and debris are a life-threatening condition. This land where we hunt, fish, gather, subsist resources, butcher our whales, which is the most precious activity that we have, are contaminated and needs to be cleaned up. The cost to clean up the contamination is astronomical, but we cannot put a price on the health of families, not even on one human life that could be saved. I know for a fact that 80% of a family I know, I personally know, subsistence on contaminated sites from the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska legacy wells, and 80% of their family passed away from cancer. This is a fact. This is a very devastating fact. ANCs are the largest private landowners in Alaska, but burdensome regulatory permitting challenges impede our environmentally sound economic development plans. We devised a way to get rid of the contaminants with ADEC, but environmental permits didn't allow us to permanently dispose of them in an approved area. It costs millions of dollars to ship them out of Alaska. Uh, it, Mr. Rexford, closing, can, you, can you wrap up your Yes, testimony? in closing, thank you for being patient with me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with each of you today. I am hopeful we can together work together to ensure contaminated lands and are cleaned up to the benefit of all Americans without threats to human life. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for both 
both of you providing uh, firsthand testimony of the challenges. I think we'll go to uh, five minute uh, rounds of questions. I'll ask people to be myself included, uh, adhere to that so that we can get in as many uh, uh, folks as possible. Uh, Ms. Harden, you cite a, an article, and I think it's this one, uh, but I wanted to ask, it's called The Real Damage While FEMA is Denying Disaster to Black Families that Have Lived for Generations in the Deep South. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the article cites that um, many, many families are being denied aid by FEMA because essentially people have inherited the properties through generations, mm -hmm. but they haven't, they don't have paperwork to show that it's inherited. Mm -hmm. I was down in Puerto Rico after the uh, Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. and uh, this was a terrible problem there. Uh, we pushed very hard to have it remedied, and uh, FEMA worked out a, a fix allowing people to self-certify it after enormous pressure. But this article says that FEMA has been unwilling to extend the same fix to the Deep South. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a part of your testimony that, uh, that this results in, in deeply discriminatory impact on communities of, of color. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, is it your, your sense that this is something we have to make sure FEMA uh, addresses? Yes, we definitely do. Um, just the fact that we've already dealt with the floods the flood has gone down and we're trying to get back to some normalcy of life. And, you know, we are a strong community and we support each other fully, but we and ourselves don't have the funds to help each individual family get back on their feet. And FEMA denying them this because of some paperwork, um, it makes it even more devastating. We need this help, um, and it just, it seems that it's continued to be overlooked. We're having the same problem in Oregon right now for families that were routinely uh, denied help after the devastating Labor Day fires right. of, of last year, uh, families that uh, don't have the same documentation that wealthier uh, families might, might right. have. So thank you for pointing that out. And Mr. Rexford, in your testimony, you note that the uh, 2016 report included three recommended steps, uh, the first of which is just getting a, a comprehensive inventory of these, I think, 650 sites so that a plan can be developed. Uh, has that inventory been completed yet? Uh, not, to my, not to my knowledge. Uh, again, it's been uh, subject to funding availability according to the federal government. Yeah. So the, uh, are any of the sites, have any of the sites been cleaned up? Some of the sites have been cleaned up, but there are still remnants of uh, contaminants and pollutions, uh, um, in many cases called uh, persistent organic pollutants. Thank, thank you. And I know dealing with uh, contaminated brownfield sites in, in my home state can be very, very difficult to get those uh, cleaned up. And part of the reason we're holding this hearing is to give voice to these types of of challenges, so thank you for sharing your story today. I want to turn uh, to uh, uh, Professor Polito, and uh, uh, Professor, I think we still have you hopefully uh, online. Uh, can you yes. address why certain groups are more impacted by pollution and are more vulnerable to climate change? Well, there's different reasons depending about which groups we're talking about and what the specific problems are. Um, and I know there's an effort oftentimes just to talk about like disenfranchisement or they're not at the table, but the reasons and purposes really go far deeper than this. As some of the other witnesses testified, there's deep processes of colonization, which are very different, for example, from why a farm worker experiences pesticide um, exposure and illnesses and death even, right, in California, or in the cases of around Cancer Alley, the areas around um, uh, the Mississippi River, like Louisiana, where there's very high levels of, of, of oil refinery. Those are a different set of reasons. Um, and what we have to do, I think, is always be looking at kind of the historical processes of what created these problems. And, um, but we do see the consistency of both um, different forms of racism, as well as exclusion, 
that is happening that are causing the problems. So we can talk about them in broad terms, but there's always very specific ones for each group that we are talking about in terms of both environmental problem as well as in terms of the various population that we're talking about, including, for example, like poor white populations as well. Uh, thank you very much. And since we're going to stick to the five minutes, Senator Wicker. Well, Drat, that means I have to stick to the five minutes. Um, I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, uh, Professor Polito um, uh, helps make my point. She agrees with me we ought to call this environmental injustice. Thank you for that. Um, and also in, your, um, in uh, her testimony, she says, in places like Mississippi, Louisiana, and South Carolina, it is the poorest who are the most impacted by hurricanes and flooding. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, the professor agreeing with me in, in, that, um, uh, in that regard. For uh, Ms. Coleman Flowers, uh, it, it occurs to me, and I think you'll agree, um, Mrs. Harden, that um, Sharkey County, where you live, sounds an awful lot like Lowndes County, Alabama, yes. which was described in her testimony. Yes, sir. Um, and, and uh, I mean, she mentions... Uh, Fish kills, mm -hmm. floods, pollution, that's exactly what we're experiencing and more in Sharkey County, Mississippi. Is yes. that correct? Yes, it is. And, and, uh, and I would just note, Mr. Chairman and uh, my fellow uh, senators, that the, the population loss during the time that this, um, that this Mississippi Rivers and Tributaries program has been promised has been astounding. In 1940, the population of Sharkey County was 15,000, Mr. Chairman. To, uh, in, in 2018, the latest figures I have, uh, just under 4,400 people, the entire population of Sharkey County, it's gone from 15,000 plus to 4,400 plus since 1940, the very time when the residents of the South Delta have been crying out to, to complete this. Now, Ms. Harden, let's make sure we understand. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a three-part promise. Correct. Levies. Correct. The gate at Steel Bayou, mm -hmm. and what else? The pumps. The pumps. And so the federal government, in its wisdom, uh, was able to complete two parts of this, leaving uh, the pumps undone. There'll still be flooding after we have the pumps. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's just that we'll know where the flooding will stop yes. and there'll be the certainty. It, 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 can you elaborate on that, okay. Ms. Harden? Just a sense of knowing for us, um, and we do know if those pumps are in, the floods would not be as high. Our farmers would be able to be in the fields working, which means they're able to employ um, some of the lower income people. If the farmers can't plant, then they can't hire. So it becomes hectic on some other employees, some other businesses, to um, try and make sure that these people working for us, their husbands are working on these farms. We are trying to ensure that if they don't have a job, how do we get more income into their home so that they can still live sufficiently until the flood is gone again? Thank you for that. And, and I appreciate Senator Merkley mentioning the problem we have with title to property. And I think with large families, without a will, the laws of distent uh, and distribution, sometimes uh, back when I was trying to eke out a living as a small town lawyer, it was very difficult to find all the heirs and so I appreciate Senator Merkley's efforts with self-certification there with FEMA. It is fair to say, though, Ms. Harden, that uh, once we get this third leg of the project done, there will be less need for FEMA to come in because the flooding will be in an area where, uh, where people will, will know in advance that you shouldn't build there, you shouldn't plant there. Uh, if you do, you're assuming the risk. Because you know. And we have dealt with this all these years. And, and people say, we'll move. This is our home. It's been our home for many years. We can't just up and move. And then a lot of the lower income, how are they going to move? Right. 
their stuff. That's been their property for generations. Exactly. Let me ask you briefly, because the chair is going to wield that gavel. Uh, would this project benefit or harm wildlife? Would it benefit or harm aquatic species? It's going to benefit the wildlife. We saw so much devastation in 2019 where you would travel somewhere down the roads and you would see all the dead animals on the side of the road. The deer, the, the turkeys, just everything. Some turkeys were extinct, some, you know, and it should not be. Um, people saying that this will harm wildlife. Well, all they had to do was come to Rolling Fork, come to the Delta, and look and see how this flooding harmed our wildlife. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Carper. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, tell me where you're from, both of you. I'm from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. I would have guessed Boston, but okay. <laughs> and, and how about you, sir? Pardon, sir. Yeah, where are you from? Uh, Barrow, Alaska, top of the world, as far north as you can go in the United States. Okay. Who would you say is your favorite senator? senator? Pardon? Who's your favorite U.S. senator from Alaska? <laughs> senator? <laughs> you got a couple of good ones. You got a couple of good ones. Uh. Well, let me just say to uh, our chair and, uh, and ranking member, thanks for, for convening this, uh, this hearing today. And, and we thank uh, both of you for, uh, for joining us. I think we have a couple of other witnesses who apparently are going to come as well. Um, today, I believe, is the first uh, Senate uh, Environment Public Works Committee hearing in, uh, in almost uh, 15 years on the subject of environmental justice, first one. And the first since uh, the subcommittee has been renamed to include the words environmental justice in it. But as we all know, this uh, topic and the need for government to address it is far from new. For decades, uh, minority communities and low-income Americans have shouldered much of the burden from pollution and other environmental problems that impact uh, our nation. Uh, it's often uh, hard to illustrate the enormity of a problem such as this, but there's one statistic, one statistic that stands out in my mind, and that's a report last year that found that 70% of the nation's most environmentally contaminated sites are located within just one mile of federally assisted housing. Think about that. 70% of our nation's most contaminated sites are all located within one mile of federally assisted housing. That's just uh, one drop in the bucket, one funding of myriad, more, uh, uh, that all paint the, the same picture, crystal clear. And we're long overdue for a reckoning here. Yeah. So when we say environmental justice is not a buzzword or a talking point, environmental justice means that we have a moral obligation to put justice and fairness at the forefront of all the work that we do. I talk, when I talk about environmental justice, I say it's a, another way of saying golden rule, treat other people the way we want to be treated. But this has to be a, a top priority for all of us, Democrats, Republicans, independents. I could speak uh, for myself to say that's certainly the case as I approach our work on this committee, from which I'm privileged to, to chair, and through the Environmental uh, Justice Caucus, which I co-founded with our colleagues, uh, Senator Duckworth and Senator uh, Booker. So I'm pleased that our committee is leading by example. In April, our committee led Senate passage of the Bipartisan Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act by a margin of 89 to 2. We don't do many things around here by 89 to 2, but it's a huge, huge vote. And our legislation makes overdue investments in our nation's water infrastructure so that our most vulnerable communities would have access to reliable, clean water and the means to pay for it. One part of our bill that I'm especially proud of, 40% of the funds in the legislation are designated to go to underserved rural and tribal communities, including communities in, um, in Alaska. Uh, this funding will be crucial in helping disadvantaged communities make necessary upgrades and to ensure families access to clean water and a healthier, brighter future for, for their kids. And with measures like uh, this, we can start to do right by our neighbors and help those most in need, whether they're neighbors around the, the street, around the block, across the town, another community or the county, but those are our neighbors too. Through the American Rescue Plan, we need to set aside $50 million for environmental justice grants. At the, we also set aside some $50 million for environmental justice grants at the APA and another $50 million to improve air quality monitoring for our communities most threatened by dangerous air pollutants. Now, as this body is uh, in the final 
Final uh, uh, sprint working on expansive legislation to invest in our nation's infrastructure and economy. We must keep our focus on this core principle of fairness to fulfill the moral obligation to lift those in greatest need and pursue justice in all that we do. This is especially true when it comes to providing a nurturing environment so critical to livelihoods and prospects for generations to come. We must make sure that we're working to uh, create a better uh, future for all of our neighbors, whether they live, again, on, in, uh, in our community or in some other community or across, uh, across the town. But uh, that's why I'm pleased we're having this hearing and discussion that explores this important uh, issue. We thank you for coming today. Now, <coughs> a long wind up for a short question. Um, in your testimony, uh, you mentioned that you wrote a book about how rural communities have traditionally been denied access to sustainable and resilient infrastructure. With natural disasters and extreme weather events on the rise, investing in these communities as well as other communities that have suffered from historic disinvestment will become even more important. Here's the question. How can the federal government help environmental justice communities prepare for climate change and its effect? Is this for Senator, is, is this for uh, Ms. Flowers? Uh, this is for Ms. Flowers. Ms. Flowers is online and so we'll. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think the way the federal government could, could help environmental justice communities uh, adjust to climate change is to pass the American Jobs Plan. Uh, I think that it is a start in making sure that 40% of those investments are going to those communities that are frontline communities that are most overburdened. And I think we've seen some examples of that today uh, with, with the other witnesses. So uh, I support that effort. I was just in uh, a community where people are dealing with raw sewage running into their homes for over 20 years. And, and, but I think this is the first time that I've heard since I've been doing this work an effort to try to address this in, in, in all of America, but certainly in rural communities. Yeah, I understand. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that, for that uh, response, Ms. Lawrence. Uh, can I just mention the question for the record, and, and we'll ask uh, our, uh, our witnesses just to respond for the record. But the question would be, please tell us more. This is for Mr. Uh, Polito, Ms. Polito, Laura Polito. Um, here's a question. Please tell us more about how threats to water access impact environmental justice communities, especially those in rural areas, and how does this threat compare to the threats from cumulative pollution releases that you mentioned in your testimony. That's my, my question, and we'll just ask you to respond to the question for the record. Again, our thanks to all of you for testifying today and for holding this hearing and let me participate. Thank you very much, Chair Carper, and, and uh, now co-chair. Um, the microphone is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. Um, you know, in order to support environmental justice communities, I think it's imperative that rulemaking and permitting processes still allow these communities to have economic opportunities. You've spoken about that. I've supported bills like the Use It Act, which helps to maximize development of carbon capture technology. Those promising technologies are essential to reducing emissions while we're protecting jobs. President Biden has recognized that reducing power sector emissions requires, quote, leveraging the carbon pollution-free energy potential of power plants retrofitted with carbon capture. So, uh, Ms. Flowers, I was surprised when I read the recommendations from the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, of which you were the, um, uh, either, the, I think the co vice chair, I think. Uh, and um, that group st stated in their report, quote, that any support for carbon capture utilization and storage would harm disadvantaged communities. So I'm asking you, Ms. Flowers, if you do you personally agree with that recommendation that the administration should stop supporting uh, carbon capture and utilization technology? Well, first of all, I don't speak on behalf of the WeJet. Uh, I'm here as a private citizen, but I will give you my personal opinion. Okay. My personal opinion is based on my conversations with with environmental um, activists living in communities in California and other places that that uh, that could potentially deal with carbon capture. They're concerned that carbon capture will harm their communities. And I think that the position of the uh, other folk in the in the WeJack that that made sure that that was there was based on the lived experiences of people who have dealt with carbon capture, who believe that it would do harm. And part of one of the tenets of environmental justice is to do no harm. So, but in my personal opinion, I would like to see 
uh, air quality monitoring in Cancer Alley and whatever needs to happen to make sure that those plants are either shut down or they're not polluting those communities as they are today. I don't, I don't have enough information about carbon capture to be able to make an educated opinion about it. But basically, what I am looking for is whatever kinds of technologies that can make sure that we all have access to clean air and clean water. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just, the reason I'm interested in this, obviously, is where I'm from. I'm from West Virginia, but it, uh, the, the report uh, that came from the uh, White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, Council is different than what the actual administration and uh, Council of Environmental Quality is saying that uh, CCUS has a critical role to play in decarbonizing the, the global economy. So I think that's a, um, a uh, ju juxtaposition there of two different positions coming from the same administration. Um, you know, I'd like to know from uh, Ms. Harden and, and Mr. Rex Road, this is something I've struggled with, uh, again, being a West Virginian, um, because we have so many people that are heavily impacted by regulations or by new policies that come forward or by the inability to fix the problems. But where my frustration comes from, and I think I hear this from both of you, is that do you actually go to the, the people that live there who actually, Mr. Rex Road, you said it well in your statement, nobody is going to care for your play, your environment, your property, your part of the world that's so deep in your culture better than you. Nobody ha knows how to care for that better than you. And so is that a frustration for you that sometimes all these decisions are made and your voice is never heard? Uh, thank you for the question. The, we truly believe that uh, at heart we are con uh, by nature, by, by culture, by how we live off the land, we are the best stewards of the land. Right. We, we walk the land. We, we tent, we fish, we hunt, we trap. All these things bring a spiritual link and a personal link to the land that we care for. That sustains our way of life. And in, in terms of the rest of Alaska, I, I, I truly believe that the 130,000 Native Alaskans share that philosophy of life. And many of them are being directly or indirectly impacted by these contaminants and pollutants. Thank you. Well, you would believe that West Virginians are right there with you. And uh, I think a lot of people in the country and Mississippians, the same. You, you, Ms. Harden, you mentioned, uh, you know, people say, just leave, you know, just just go away. You can't. Right. You can't. You don't want to. It's, yeah. it's, it's part of who you are. And you, you go out into your community. Well, most of the time. Um, the community comes to us yeah. um, because our our dairy bar is like the center of right. our town, and you know you get the you get the farmer coming in and telling you how things are and how hard it's going to be for their life, and then you get the farmers' employees coming in and letting you know how hard it's going to be for their life, and it, it's just. It's, it goes on and on from the top to the bottom. Thanks. I see it all and I hear it all. Right. And my job, my job isn't just to be a business owner. My job is to care for these people and mm -hmm. take care of these people because they are who takes care of me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Capito. Senator Duckworth is next joining us online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Flowers, thank you for your work as a fierce advocate for environmental justice, especially in functional sanitation for our communities across the United States. Your testimony it has very clearly demonstrated the very urgent need to address our failing infrastructure, especially in sanitation inequality. Um, as chair of the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife and Water, I agree and believe that access to clean, safe water is a basic human right. And it is unacceptable that these very vulnerable communities are impacted by poor water quality and access. You can just look at the town of Centerville, Illinois, to see that oftentimes when these issues occur in neighborhoods of minority or low income communities, it takes far too long for the public to hear about it or for people to get involved. For decades, we have turned a blind eye to the water issues in this country and failed to provide adequate funding for these systems. My Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act 
would invest over 35 billion federal dollars to assist these vulnerable communities in receiving the funding they need to modernize their drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. I know that this amount of funding will be a great start, but this must be a continuing legacy in order to really make a difference. Ms. Flowers, would you agree that access to safe, reliable drinking water and wastewater is an environmental justice issue? Yes, Senator Duckworth, it is an environmental justice issue. And clearly uh, what we saw in, in Lowndes County, we did a parasite study where we actually collected fecal blood and, and water and soil samples. And we found evidence of hookworm and other tropical parasites uh, in, in areas, especially in areas where people are not dealing with uh, proper sanitation. And this is a problem throughout the U.S. And yes, I went to Centerville and actually saw it firsthand. And, and I'm happy that you're sponsoring this type of fix. And it needs to be a continuous effort because the problems are worse than we even know because there's no central database that documents sanitation issues across the U.S. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. Do you think that major federal investment in water infrastructure should be a top environmental justice priority? Yes, because water is life and none of us can live without water. And we have seen what happens when we don't deal with the health consequences of these issues, especially how it impacts the public, because it could very well be that um, typhoid and all the other kinds of things that comes about as a result of, of, of inadequate sanitation could happen again. And COVID has taught us when it comes to the public health that we cannot turn a blind eye to it because we are all impacted by it. Water is life. You are so, so right. Um, in Illinois, we have more known lead service lines than any other state in the country. And as you know, there is no known safe blood level for lead in our children. Therefore, these outdated pipes are a threat to our children's health and this threat is especially higher for minority children. The Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021, which passed the full Senate with 89 votes on the floor, would invest federal dollars into the testing for and replacement of lead pipes. And the president has made it one of his top priorities to fund billions of dollars for the national full lead line replacement. Ms. Pulido and Ms. Flowers, do you think the federal government should prioritize billions of federal dollars to remove all of the lead service lines in this country? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I know it sounds like a no brainer to you and me, but let me tell you, there are others who would argue otherwise. Um, people of color are one and a half times more likely to live in an area with poor air quality this can lead to major health problems like asthma, heart attacks, cancer, and reproductive issues. In fact, if you're in Chicago and you go just 10 stops on our uh, rapid transit system, the L uh, from uh, our, the, the part of Chicago, the magnificent mile where you have you know, uh, shops selling thousand dollar Gucci purses and you go 10 stops on the L to a black and brown neighborhood, just 10 stops, the uh, uh, life expectancy drops by 18 years, not from gun violence, but from health issues like asthma, heart attacks, cancer. Um, uh, you know, I have been pushing for efforts to increase air monitoring on a hyper-local level. Ms. Polito, to address the infrastructure inequity, would federal implementation of mapping and screening tools help address these shortcomings by identifying the communities that need it most and connect them with policy solutions? Furthermore, what other tools do you think are necessary to ensure the federal infrastructure investments are being discussed get to the correct most vulnerable communities they are intended for. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, yes, we have to begin by simply, you know, uh, having the right data, right? Um, and we don't have that. And it's a problem. Uh, it's on multiple levels. Oftentimes we have poor quality data. So that needs to be really improved. A lot of times community um, scientists and organizations, they do ground truthing to try to verify the data like is there a pollution source there or and things like that so quality improving the quality of data is really really important um second of all then as i said earlier we need to address like the cumulative impacts right versus the individual um facility or emitter which certainly is important but does not capture like what you're saying is happening on those stops that have you know an 18 percent or 18 year uh difference in um longevity. So that's due to the cumulative environment that we're talking about. And we have very limited ability, although I know Illinois is one of the states that has made steps to begin talking about cumulative impacts. So we need to absolutely see that 
across the board. Um, and this becomes really a very uh, uh, urgent, particularly in, in cities, in urban areas, um, more so than many rural areas, although not entirely, that, that's not the case. Um, and one of the last things that you've said is what else does a federal government need to be doing? Or one of the things that I think is really important is to think about, uh, I frankly feel that in the part of the federal government, as well as many other government agencies, there has been a lack of political will to really go after and enforce the existing environmental laws. I mean, we're not even talking about, you know, people that aren't uh, outside the scope of the law. We can't even enforce the existing laws. We've had cases, for example, in Los Angeles of major polluters such as Exide, which has was their lead emissions were 50 times over the uh, regulatory limit. It took them decades um, and they would not actually solve the problem. They were forced to finally close down, after which then they decided to clear bankruptcy, leaving the entire state of California with the cleanup bill for acres and acres of lead contamination. So there has to be a higher level of political will to actually enforce existing laws. Thank you. I'm over time, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you very much, Senator Duckworth. We'll turn to Senator Sullivan. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think, um, thank you for holding this hearing. I think we already have one unanimous agreement from here, and that's on water and the issues that Senator Duckworth just mentioned. I'll mention in Alaska, and Mr. Reckford certainly knows this, we have over 30 communities that don't have any running water. No flush toilets, nothing. No running water. They're almost all Alaska Native communities. These are American citizens. I think it's just completely inappropriate. By the way, some of the most patriotic Americans in the country, Alaska Natives, like lower 48 Native Americans serve at higher rates in the military than any other ethnic group in the country, and yet, they don't have water. That's just unacceptable, and I think we all need to work on it. I think there's bipartisan support to do that. Mr. Rexford, thank you again, sir, for being here, traveling uh, very far for this meeting. And I, I appreciate you mentioning King Cove in your testimony as well. That's very magnanimous of you to be talking about a native community that's almost probably a 1,000 miles away from your native community. Mm -hmm. But it makes the point, and I think it was a really good point, let me go back to your issue of contaminated lands. And again, for my, my Senate colleagues here, this is the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, the biggest Native Settlement Act probably in certainly American history, maybe world history, 44 million acres, and yet so much of the land was contaminated. Now, we've made some progress here. We got uh, clarified, thanks to the work of Chairman Carper recently, that the CERCLA liability will not apply to ANCs. Finally clarified that. But Mr. Rexford, what other types of assistance do communities such as yours need from the federal government to address this issue 45 years, almost 50 years, where there has been cleanup by the federal government, which clearly is responsible for cleaning up these contaminated lands? What more assistance and other type of assistance would you recommend? Thank you, Senator Sullivan. I think in one word it would be commitment. Commitment. Commitment to clean up. Yeah. Um, I have a reference docket I have prepared for the committee here in re referencing to relative um, issues that have substance on our continued efforts to work with the Navy on cleanup. But the message is um, we'll give it to you as is, where is and you are liable for cleanup. Good. And we Commit cannot live with that. We can't afford it. Consistent commitment. Your testimony does a really good job at kind of showing how the feds sometimes are engaged and they're not engaged. So you want consistent commitment to this issue. Yes, commitment. Great. Let me ask another uh, question. Um, I mentioned the resource development opportunities. Senator Capito mentioned some of the regulatory issues. Can you tell us how, just one example, the Barrow Natural Gas Field discovery had a very big beneficial impact on your community. Can you speak to that as just one example of how resource development has provided opportunities, provided energy, low-cost energy, and other things in your community that 
I think a lot of times people just take for granted in the lower 48, but can be very important in Alaska. Yes, uh, Senator Sullivan and the committee members. Um, as a child growing up, uh, I, one of my tasks was to get firewood from the beaches or from the landfill in order to heat the home and cook, melt water, et cetera. And then that escalated to a coal um, bag I had to put on a sled and take home from the uh, Indian Education Service uh, Barrow Native Co-op store. And that was the process. And then that escal escalated to heating oil, namely um, heating oil number one, uh, to put uh, two and a half gallons into a stove um, that is on the back of a heater, and you had to be very careful. And that was one of my, ta those were my tasks uh, uh, in our household. One day I went home and, and two, three days passed by. I was about eight, nine years old, and I didn't have to go pick up that field oil to heat the house. I said, Mom, are, are we going to run out of fuel? She said, no, we got natural gas now. This is the benefit that we have now, is that we've got cost-effective um, natural gas to heat our homes. Clean uh, burning, too, correct? Yes, yes. And, and it took years for the, for the Native Village of Barrow and the City of Barrow Council to advocate for it from the federal government. But they did. They, it took a long time. Good. Thank but you. But it has been resourceful for us in that it has. I'd like to make a comparison right now. Yes, please. If you go into the villages, you're going to pay up to 250 a gallon or 350 a gallon to heat a home for three or four days. This is reality in the villages. In the seven outlying villages outside the bar, we are fortunate that through negotiations and through advocacy um, in the 1960s that we were able to get natural gas hook up to the community. That made a world of difference. Then we could melt water, we could uh, have showers, and we were fortunate enough. But still, many today don't have that luxury. We call it a luxury because it's taken for granted. It's it, a luxury, it, but people in the lower 48, they don't view it as a luxury. You do, though. Let me just put it in this um, analogy. When I woke up in the morning, the water basin would be frozen. That's my analogy of water, uh, water service that needs to be corrected. For those communities you mentioned earlier, that simple life-saving water source that is healthy and sanitary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to, Mr. Rexford, I want to follow up um, on Senator Sullivan's first uh, question about cleanup, um, specifically regarding, you know, Superfund cleanup. I appreciate the focus in your testimony on the ways that tribes are often left behind in the Superfund cleanup process. Uh, like Alaskan Native corporations, many tribes in Arizona have struggled for decades to compete for funding in the Superfund process. For example, there are more than 500 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. And despite years of work uh, on the part of tribal leaders and repeated commitments from federal leaders to work to clean up these sites, only four sites, only four out of 500 are currently undergoing remediation in large part because for many sites, it has been impossible to locate a responsible, a responsible party with the ability to pay. So Mr. Rexford, can you expand upon your testimony for why the existing process used, for, by, used by EPA for prioritizing Superfund cleanup sites may put tribes at a disadvantage? In terms of the Superfund or funding programs for contaminant and pollutant uh, cleanup, either we have to work directly with the Native Village of Barrow or the Inupiat community of the Arctic Slope to receive those funds. Or we can do a partnership with the North Slope Borough, um, borough-wide home rule government. The reason why we're, we're, we're not getting what we need is priorities set by EPA, priorities set by regulation, don't quite get to our villages. Now, when an accident occurs, that seems to be the time that we get a drop in the bucket. 
um, like the uh, like the Valley of Ten Thousand Barrels. Someone gets hurt, and then they provide NALEM funding, and they were able to clean up in a, a period of four years in four summer seasons. Or when we applied for uh, funds funding, we didn't qualify because we weren't a tribe. The white alice sites, the dewline sites that are infested with asbestos, PCBs, and are still on the ground. When EPA and ADEC and BLM called on me to identify the site locations at, at Camp Lonely, um, we had to show them map uh, where those locations were. I worked a lot of those sites in my lifetime with a labor union, with the Teamsters. And we need our share of money to clean those up. Now, residuals in the villages, you can see Sheen. I'll use Point Hope as an example. At the Nursal Borough Mayor's Office, I was taking the lead on the radioactive isotopes that were left behind by the Atomic Energy Commission of the United States in the 60s. They left the isotopes in the ice in the in the sort body of water that the local people use for water. Hmm. And it had the highest cancer rates in the nation at the time. The community couldn't understand why everyone was getting sick when they were not being exposed to anything they knew of physically. And yet this drinking water source had radioisotopes that the Atomic Energy Commission left buried and said, Leave it alone. But Ogotora Creek was a water source for the community. And, and we have had to bury many, many of our relatives in, in, in Point Hope over the years because of that very fact. That has been noted um, in reports uh, to the Atomic Energy Commission and, and, and the federal government. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, Tupaharu site, the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska site. Families subsisted there, and 80% of that family directly died of cancer. Cancer, people of promise, people that were very productive in, in, in the, how we support the community through whaling, through subsistence. Eight of their family members of 12 died from cancer. Eight. This is devastating. These are facts that we live with. And we need the money. We would like to be able to clean up the money. Lake, that was a water source for the community for decades. The Air Force used it as a water source. The Department of Navy used it as a water source. However, the contaminants from the 1963 100-year um, flood devastated that water source, and now paths are known to be in there. And so we're putting up signs, do not drink water from Imakpuk Lake. After centuries of access, access to this water source, we are telling our own people, do not drink this water source. So how do you get the money to, to the impacted community, to the impacted agency that is responsible for that? They want us to sign on a document that says we're going to receive it, ask you where it is, and we put the bill of millions of dollars of cleanup. We can't do that. We would deprive our next generation of, of shareholders opportunities for education, opportunities for health care, and benefits for travel when they need it in emergencies. This is how we put back what little economic profit that we have so that we can continue to support them, especially for those that are needy. My colleague oh, in my peer to my right has very eloquently described the very things that we are faced with in the rural community. We share the same concerns. We have the same problems. But how do you get federal government to say, okay, this is a priority. We've got 3,500 people that are being affected. We've got eight of 12 people in the family that have died. How do you balance that in the name of cleanup or the loss of a life? I'm passionate about this because they are my people, my community, and I represent them. But I lived with them. I grew up with them. And I've seen them go. Thank you for your question. I do hope I didn't miss your question. No, you didn't. And. Um...
you know, it's apparent that there needs to be, you know, more direct funding where you do not have to apply to, you know, multiple or agencies uh, uh, that the funds need to get uh, to the communities to do this cleanup. And I appreciate your um, examples. I mean, they're compelling. Uh, we have, you know, similar examples all over Arizona. Um, that where this cleanup needs to, um, we've got to do better. I mean, four, uh, for ura abandoned uranium mines, I mean, four out of 500, it's unacceptable. Well, thank you, Mr. Rexford. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this <clears throat> very important hearing. Uh, environmental justice populations have been burdened over and over again by pollution, disinvestment, and designed neglect, not benign neglect, designed neglect. And as discussed by Professor Polito, it is critically important to address not just individual sources of pollution, but the cumulative impacts uh, of each alongside socioeconomic conditions. In drafting the Environmental Justice uh, Mapping and Data Collection Act, uh, Senator Duckworth and I work closely with environmental justice advocates to create a framework for a federal method to map these cumulative impacts and ensure that communities that are most at risk from environmental injustices are prioritized as we address the climate crisis. Professor Polito and Ms. Flowers, would you agree that it is important uh, to consult with communities in the process of creating these maps, as well as in addressing any gaps in data that would make it harder to understand and tackle environmental justice issues? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. I think, yes, we have to consult those communities. Just to give you a quick example, in a lot of the rural communities, where if, if you don't go down those dirt roads and know that people are there, they will, be, they will not be counted. And I think it's very important that the people that are impacted are also part of the data collection because that's why we have so many gaps. Beautiful. Thank you. Ms. Flowers? Um, I would agree with that. I think it's really essential. One of the things that we've seen, um, I haven't seen the federal um, model or what you're uh, hoping to, what, what it will look but I know in cases like at the Cal EJ screen, which has been one prototype that has been developed, when they go and involve local community members, they can point out sensitive land uses that would also impact how we understand cumulative impacts. So for example, is there a child care center there? Or is there like an elder care facility there? Or schools? Those all have big differences. So it is very essential for this to happen. Thank you. And uh, to, the, to both of you, uh, again, with dedicated funding, for community engagement, cumulative impact mapping, and data collection make it easier to prioritize and properly value communities' contributions to these efforts. Yes. Yes, I yes. agree. Excellent. Um, Professor Polito highlighted in her testimony, extreme heat is an environmental justice issue, even within the same city due to due in part to historic redlining and differences in tree cover. Some neighborhoods, often lower income communities, or communities of color can be up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Despite the fact that most heat related deaths and illnesses are preventable, extreme heat events kill more Americans than any other weather event. As the old saying goes, an ounce of preve uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's why I will soon be reintroducing my Preventing Heat Illness and Deaths Act to strengthen interagency efforts to address extreme heat and provide financial assistance for projects that reduce the health impact of extreme heat events such as urban tree plantings, cool roofs and streets, and cooling centers. Climate change is only going to worsen the extreme heat crisis we need prevention now. Professor Polito and Ms. Flowers, would you agree that additional investment in extreme heat prevention could help address historic inequities and prevent and protect uh, public health? Absolutely. It is urgently needed. People are dying. 
Again, Senator, I concur that this is definitely needed. Yes. Yeah, thank you both for that. And, uh, and finally, in the grips uh, of a respiratory pandemic, healthy air shouldn't even be determined by zip code. But even within a single neighborhood, air quality can vary up to 800%. We can't manage what we don't measure, and federal funding levels for air quality support have remained unchanged for nearly two decades, which is unbelievable. And that's why I'm working on legislation that provides grant and contract funding for hyper-local air quality monitoring in environmental justice communities. Professor Polito and Ms. Flowers, would you agree that it is important for us to be able to identify, communicate about, and finally work to resolve air pollution hotspots all across our country? Yes, I would agree, absolutely. Yes, I also agree, and I think that the people in, in Cancer Alley would welcome that. Yeah, and, uh, and again, Cancer Alley is just one example that has proliferated across our entire country. It's just time for us to have environmental justice at the core of any piece of legislation which we passed this year, uh, because if you don't map it, it's impossible then to uh, rectify the historic injustices. So thank you both for your work historically, and thanks to both of our panelists as well. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting this. Thank hearing. you, Senator Markey. And we're going to have a second round in which each senator is allowed one question. Mm. <laughs> and so if you'd like to stay and you have something else you'd like to, I know Senator Sullivan has a question, and I understand Senator Wicker might return for an additional question. So my additional question goes uh, to you, Ms. Uh, flowers, and you refer in your testimony to Cancer Alley along the Mississippi uh, River uh, and uh, where residents combat very high cancer rates due to pollution. What is the source of that pollution that is affecting residents in Cancer Alley? Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. I had the opportunity to visit Cancer Alley and was taken on a tour through the communities and meeting with community people led by uh, retired General Russell Honore. And the way I was shocked by what I saw is, is almost like a Disneyland of petrochemical plants sitting along the Mississippi River. And even though I was only there for several hours, uh, I myself had respiratory issues once I left there that it took me, I had to really go to bed for about a week trying to figure out what was going on with me. And uh, I, I, it just, it, to me, it made me feel that it's really even harder for people that have to live there. And these plants are located next to homes, they're located next to, um, they're located next to schools. And the people have been crying out for the longest about getting uh, air quality monitors there so that they can monitor what's there and be able to show the correlation between what is being emitted in the area and, and, and the illnesses that they are dealing with. So that is, is so needed and Cancer L is just one example as you stated earlier, but, uh, but clearly we have to use that maybe as an example of how we get local people involved and be able to monitor and track what is happening there. Uh, thank, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. And I'll just note that one of the side effects of, of natural gas is climate change that is driving the tremendous fires out in Oregon. But another side effect uh, is natural gas is the feedstock for the petrochemical industry making plastics and results in very high cancer rates for those who are located nearby. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to raise an issue that I've, I've, I've raised a number of times in this um, in this com uh, committee, you know, the, B the Biden administration stated focus, and I don't know if you can bring over here a little bit more, um, on racial equity and environmental justice, in my view, is not fully considered the welfare of Alaska Natives, uh, which are certainly our biggest minority group in Alaska, who have seen great advances in life expectancy, life expect expectancy because of the opportunities and health benefits of resource development. So 
This is a chart that shows, that's from an American Medical Association study on changes in life expectancy in America from 1980 to 2014. The dark blue and purple are the biggest increases, up to 13 years. And the uh, yellow and red are actually, unfortunately for our country, decreases. That's a lot of where the opioid epidemic has hit communities very hard. But Alaska had the highest life expectancy increases of any place in the country, by far. And the reason is twofold. One is, unfortunately, the Alaska Native people had a very low life expectancy to begin with. But resource development started happening on the North Slope, the Northwest Arctic Borough, the Aleutian Island chain. And I'm worried that as this administration starts to focus on shutting down those opportunities in our rural communities, that these incredible advances, 13 year life expectancy increases. I don't think there's anything more important than that in terms of an indicator of policy success than are the people you represent living longer. And in Alaska, they're living longer because of these opportunities. I'm worried that we're gonna go backwards in this important area if this administration focuses on shutting down resource development opportunities in our state, particularly the rural areas. Mr. Rexford, you have a lot of experience with this general issue, seeing life expectancies increase, economic opportunity that comes with resource development. Would you like to comment on this? And do you have concerns that if these opportunities are shut down, we're gonna be going backwards? Yes, thank you, Senator Sullivan, uh, committee members. Um, in my entire lifetime, uh, my father was uh, with a Teamsters Union and worked uh, resource development um, going to remote sites for six months out of the year and come home uh, through Arctic constructors and USGS seeking um, oil, oil and gas exploration so that we can have resources to develop. And then he was there during the discovery of the pipeline at Parson Camp um, in Dead Horse in Puda Bay. Um, I worked the pipeline. There was a benefit to economic jobs. And, and also the state of Alaska enjoyed the, um, the royalties that allowed us to, to get, in some cases, basic, basic services, water, wastewater treatment. And, and, and yet today, the, there are struggles. The benefits that I have directly seen since 1974 in my short lifetime after graduating from high school in 1973, is our ability to tax oil and gas properties. We don't have a royalty. Don't get me wrong. We don't have royalty, but we had to file a lawsuit so that we could generate revenue to build roads, to build health clinics, to build fire stations, to, to build airports, um, high school and school junior high facilities. Um, Every program and service, behavioral health, that comes with infrastructure needs. That is basically just from the ad valerium tax of approximately 2.5%, 1.8 to 2.5% annually. That helps support it, provide economic jobs, safe water, health clinics so that we can better get better health care and, and and detect illnesses before it went too bad. Now, when we talk about the eight villages, Barrow being the hub, and the eight villages are still struggling because infrastructure is now 45, 50 years old. We continue to upgrade them with what little money that we have to keep them going to continue the level of services. But these are the benefits that, uh, that we have received. The subsidy of um, heating oil to the villages is very crucial, especially in the economically depressed zone in several of the villages that have no economy. But there's the North Slope Borough, the native villages, the tribes, and the city that provide minimal job opportunities. They have to go outside of the community to support their families, to provide for their families. Otherwise, it's a welfare. And we are not a welfare-driven community. No. We like to be industries, yeah. industrial. We like to be productive and give back. 
with our own, with our dignity, with our self-respect, in the name of a job and employment. Thank you. That's and that's what we seek. Very powerful. Best, best government program is a good job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To, uh, to any of our witnesses, uh, President Biden's plan for uh, job creation um, is to have 40% uh, of the uh, programs of the revenues go towards uh, communities uh, that are environmental justice communities. What, in your opinion, is the best way to ensure that 40% of all of the funding goes into those communities? What would you like to see put in place in order to accomplish that goal? Do we want to direct that well, in order? Perhaps, uh, Ms. Harden, you're ready to speak to that? Go ahead. Okay. Um, the money is great, and it's needed. Um, but what we need to see in the Delta are the pumps, because without those pumps... I, I, I say, are the what? The pumps, the backwater pumps. Back we need those pumps put in. Without those pumps, we're not able to um, have many job opportunities. The businesses are closing, people are moving, and we need to be able to keep the people there. Um, so with us getting those backwater pumps, that money would be greatly needed in our area. But we need the pumps before. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Very helpful, yes. Mr. Rexford. Yes, Senator Markey, um, my ears are ringing. Would you repeat the question so I can understand it? Yeah, President Biden intends on 40% of all the funding in his uh, Jobs Creation Act uh, to mm -hmm. go to uh, environmental justice communities. What's the best way to ensure that that money gets to those communities? The, in order to have direct access to those communities, we, we need to have a entity that will receive them, administer and, uh, administer and implement the programs intended for. Now, if there um, provisions in there of that funding, what is, how is it going to filter down and, and put back into the community and sustain it? Mm -hmm. That's the question is, can we sustain after the funding is available to sustain the program to future generations? Um, in all due respect, um, I'm, you know, the Sunshine State of Florida has a lot of sun, but nine, uh, six months out of the year, ne we nearly have none. So, uh, so polar energy, you know, uh, solar energy is limited. And then, and so what type of program would generate, what kind of infrastructure would generate sustainability? And that would be a goal that we could set. This will definitely be sustainable for future generations and yet reduce, um, uh, the ability to, to maintain and operate it to a minimum, that it sustains itself. Thank I you. do hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Rexford. And if you could, my time is about to expire. Ms. Professor Polito, Ms. Flowers, would you have any uh, quick uh, insights that you would like to give to the committee as to how to make sure that funding does go to environmental justice communities? Well, first of all, uh, we should have a scorecard to make sure that it does in fact go to those communities and guardrails should be put in place to make sure that the business opportunities that are created will be created for people that live in those communities as well. Beautiful, great. And Ms. Flowers. Um, one of the things that I would say is um, by working directly with already existing community organizations, groups doing like environmental justice work, that would be an, a really good kind of conduit that are oftentimes already doing like weatherization projects and things like that. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for your contributions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Markey, and to uh, my colleagues for their variety of questions exploring this issue of economic justice and economic injustice. The, uh, there was a gathering back in... Um, 1991, uh, and this gathering was a significant landmark in the national discussion about environmental justice. There was a four-day summit attended by 
over a thousand individuals from all 50 states. It was sponsored by the Commission for Racial Justice in the United Church of Christ. And um, out of that came a set of four principles for environmental justice that have continued to reverberate through the last three decades. One is that public policy must be based on mutual respect and justice for all people. Second, that the environmental justice communities have the right to participate as equal partners in decision making, including needs assessment, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. That's the seat at the, the table. The third is the use of land and renewable resources must be ethical, balanced, and responsible in the interest of a sustainable planet for both humans and other living things. And fourth, it's important to consider the cumulative impact of every source of pollution in a community rather than looking at each source in isolation. So I wanted to close with those, um, those thoughts as, as I'm sure we'll be continuing the conversation about environmental justice. It's so important uh, to make sure that we, we do. And so now some uh, thank you, uh, Professor Polito, Ms. Coleman Flowers, Ms. Harden, uh, Mr. Rexford, for your contributions based on the experiences and knowledge you've accumulated through a lifetime. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a number of reports and articles related to today's hearing. Hearing no objection, thank you. Additionally, senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on August 5th. We will compile those questions. We'll send them out to our witnesses and ask our witnesses to reply by August 19th. So if we have questions for you all in addition from other members or members who are here today, we'll, we'll get those to you and, and we'd appreciate you, you uh, sending us answers back. We'll make part of, the, part of the record. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.